Our first slide this morning, I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore, Psalms 86, 12. Um, I think one of the things we need to think about when we come here on the Lord's Day is the freedom that we have to do so because we see so much of the lack of freedom to worship throughout the world these days. And um, so let's lift up our voices to the Lord and praise him for the freedoms that we do have in this country. Our first song will be, We Will Glorify, song 578. We will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is a great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is a great. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out to be with us here today. Um, if you think back to the beginnings of your life, where you came from, your answer is you were created by God. And as a result of that, the scriptures say we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So uh, it is a great opportunity to come together and worship our maker today. Um, So today during our sermon segment, by the way, we'll be doing our quarterly Bible Q&A. We take live questions on that, so if you have a question that you want to do, you can send it to my email address, michael at followthebible.com, and if we have opportunity to address those live today, we will certainly do that. So that would be great. It's an opportunity for you to uh, maybe get some direct feedback on an issue that you've been pondering yourself, and so again, if you have a question, you can do that. That's true for our live stream viewers as well. Just send that email to michael at followthebible.com. I have a question. Here's what it is. Send it along and we'll get to that. Also, I wanted to let you know that here at our congregation that we do not pass communion trays and things like that. Instead, we use these little kit guys. So we call them communion kits. It might be like the one that's there on the screen, or it may be one like the one that I'm holding here now. Uh, These have the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread in it that we'll be using in our communion service. And we're going to be doing that in about 15 minutes or so. So if you have not received one of these, you'll want to grab one. We have some in the back of the auditorium if you want to grab one of those or at the entry point where you came into the auditorium today. Also, if you are new to our congregation and you're visiting with us for the first time, um, or if it's been a long time since you've been by, even that would be okay, uh, we'd sure appreciate it if you'd let us know. So you can do that by texting the word Orange View, one all big one word, to 94,000. And then what that will do is it'll give you back some information about the congregation here and enable you to tell us what you would like to share about yourself as far as your name and contact information and things like that. We're not going to show up unexpectedly at your home or intimidate you in any way, but we would like to be able to send you a note or card thanking you for coming to be with us today. Now, we distribute most of our stuff electronically these days, um, so if you'd like a copy of our bulletin, you can text the word, one big word again, OV Weekly, to that same 94,000 number, and it will bounce back a link to you with our bulletin that you can then read online. If you prefer to have one in print, we do have print ones available too. So I've got them up here at the front, and during our break period, I'll be up here distributing those if you'd like one of those as well. Now, you may have some other information that you'd like to get to the uh, leadership of the congregation or you have a prayer need or something like that. We have an an access point to get that to us as well, and that is to to text the word OVCOMCARD to 94000. It will take you to this little form that's on the screen now where you can pass along whatever it is that you need to do. At the bottom of that, there's a section for comments or prayer requests. Just let us know what it is that you've got going on, and we will echo that out to the congregation for prayer. Now, you may have something you'd like to share, but you don't want it to be generally known. And if that's the case, just put in there, hey, please don't share this. It'll go to the leadership of the congregation, but would not be generally distributed out. And then also, I wanted to tell you that a primary mission of our congregation is to help people become right with God in the first place. 
So um, if you would like more information about that, we try to make that as easy as we can and give as many avenues for that as we can. So a super easy one is to text OV I'm ready to 94,000. That will bounce back information about why you'd want to become a Christian, what's involved in doing that, um, how can we actually implement those steps that are necessary. So becoming a, a child of God and becoming a Christian and experiencing that new life in Christ involves a belief in who Jesus is, a repentance, a confession of Christ that you believe that he is in fact the Messiah and are willing to follow him, and then a baptism, which is an immersion in water for the remission of sins. We have the ability to help you with all of those things, and this step of texting that will give you that information. Here's who Jesus was, here's what repentance is, all those kinds of things. Um, also, another option is you can just tap somebody on the shoulder here and say, hey, I'd like to know more about this. Any member here can help you with that. And of course, since I'm a member here, I can help you with that. So during the break period, if you want to come up here and say, okay, I'm game, you know, tell me what's going on, um, I would be happy to talk to you. And then also when we're done, I go outside to this reception area we have right outside the door, and you can come over and talk to me there as well. But anyway, we really, really want to help you with that, so please let us if you are interested. But we're going to go ahead now, we're going to begin uh, with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into our service. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you again for this time we have to come together and worship you, where we can meet as a family and encourage each other. Lord, please help us to always have our priorities set properly with you first in our lives. Help us to, to live the way you want us to live, to be an example to others, to show other people, the people around us, the benefits of being a Christian. Lord, please have mercy on those who are sick and help those who, who need help, who are going through various trials in their lives. Lord, uh, we wanna thank you again for your son who, who died for us, who gives us the hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118.24. Next song will be Highest Place, Psalm 155. We place you on the highest place. For you are the great high priest. We place you. songs they, they do mean something to us when we pick it and this particular one there's lots of things that come at us in life um, and sometimes the last thing we have is peace in our life or at least we think we don't we don't have it but um, when we look to the Lord and, and um, realize that he gives us that peace that we can't even comprehend if we ask him for it and so this is one of those songs that kind of reminds me of that as well with my soul when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is
love the Lord. I love the Lord, for he died my soul to save. On Calvary, here's their life he freely gave. From realms above, Jesus freely came to die, that I might live someday. Oh, holy preaching 
be no more than love demands, no less could I repay. No greater love hath mortal man than for a friend to die. These are the words he gently spoke to me. If just a cup of water I place within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. But if by death to living they can thy glory see, I'll take my cross and follow close to thee. Good morning. From the uh, Sermon on the Mount, we can read, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Putting others first is a huge part of the reason we are here this morning. And at least for me, this is one of the harder things to do as a, as a follower of Jesus. I mean, after all, I want others to put me first, right? Not the other way around. Loving God and loving others, those words also come directly from the mouth of Jesus. The two greatest commands. Again, however, the first command, loving God, is much easier for me than the second, loving God others. However, this shouldn't be the case, because we cannot love God without loving others. It cannot be done, because God loves us. How can we not also love others? Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, writes, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Consider others. Consider others better than yourselves. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Isn't that what Jesus' life was all about? Putting others first? Putting others first is hard to do. <clears throat> I would even suggest that it, it's unnatural. As children, we are born with a natural tendency towards self-interest. And selfishness is something that basically needs to be unlearned. Fortunately, through Jesus, we have the perfect example for what it looks like to put others first in our lives, to love others. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Isn't it incredible to think that Jesus, the creator of the universe, is the greatest example we have of what a servant should look like. And again, from Philippians, we see Jesus humbling himself as a man. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and, and became an obedient to death, even death on a cross. Another example we have of Jesus' act of service is the washing of his disciples' feet. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you should also wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. And Jesus, hours before his crucifixion, tells his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And of course, Jesus' greatest act of service. His willingness to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, our creator, our king, and the Christ became a servant, a servant to you so and to me because of his indescribable love for us. This time, we'll take of the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you this morning thanking you so much for the life of Jesus, the life of service on our behalf so that we might be children of yours. We pray that we, as we partake of this, this unleavened bread, which represents that sacrifice of Jesus, that we would do so, uh, examining ourselves, examining our lives, and thanking you for this opportunity. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Again, let us pray. Dear God, we, we come before you again, this time taking the fruit of the vine, this cup which represents that blood that was shed on that cruel cross. We pray that as we partake of this, that we might always look to you and look to Jesus as an example of service to others. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. So we're coming up to that time in our service where in just a moment we're going to take a brief break. We'll have a five-minute timer that will count down for us. Um, now, during that period of time, there are a lot of things that kind of go on. Um, but one thing that's unique for today is because we are doing our Bible Q&A sermon today, you might want to use this as an opportunity to submit your question. So if you'd like to do that, you can take your question and just email it to me, to michael at followthebible.com. And then what we'll do is we'll put that in the queue, and then if we have opportunity to address that, that, that we will. And then also, when we were settling in, I'd mentioned to you that if you wanted a print bulletin, we do have those available. Now, you can get an electronic copy immediately by texting OV Weekly to 94000. But if you want to print one, um, we have those available too. So I'll be right up here in the front distributing those. So if anybody wants one, come on up and get one of those. And then also, I'll be distributing the Kids Pack. Now, the Kids Pack is an instructional packet that's designed to teach the sermon material to the younger element of the congregation. Now, they are directly keyed to the sermon content, so uh, they are educational in nature. Crossword puzzles and word finds and coloring and things like that. So if you'd like to get one of those, if you're a younger guy, come on up and retrieve one of those. I'll get one of those to you. And then when our services are over today and I'm out in that reception area, you can bring it up to me, show, you that, show me that you've done it, and then I'll pass a, a, a treat or a prize along to you. Um, another thing that might be useful to you during this time is to send a note or card to your brothers or sisters in Christ that are here, but that might need some encouragement of some way. So out in the lobby, we have all the things that are necessary to do that. Um, in those little cubbies, there are cards there at the top, and if you'd like to send a note or card to someone uh, to encourage them or wish them a happy birthday or whatever, go ahead and do that. Write your note out on the envelope. Just put the person's name that it goes to, and then drop it in that box that says Outgoing Mail. And then we will take it from there. So we'll finish the rest of the address, put a stamp on it, and take care of that. And then finally, also during this time, it might be an opportunity for you to come up and say, okay, I'd like to know more about becoming a Christian. 
And if you want to do that by coming up and talking with me, that'd be great. Or talking to someone else, that would be fine too. And then another option for you as well is that you can text OV, I'm ready to 94,000. Now, something I didn't mention to you when we were settling in, but I'll mention now, is that that would also give you an opportunity to kind of explore some issues that you have maybe on a confidential basis. So you can still kind of, kind of hide in the shadows and explore some issues or thoughts that you'd have that you'd like some more information on through that process. But anyway, we'll go ahead now and we'll start our timer and I'll see you all back here in five minutes. Thanks so much. Our next song will be Pure in Heart, Oh God. Song number 671. Purer in heart, O oh God, help me to be. May I devote my life wholly to Thee. Watch Thou my wayward feet, guide me with counsel sweet. Pure such, so that's fine. Um, so today we are in fact doing our quarterly Bible Q&A, so uh, we do take questions live as we have opportunity to do them. So um, you can text me, some people have texted me, that's fine. Um, you can also submit your question by email to michael at followthebible.com. And then, uh, like I said, I've got my stuff up here to kind of monitor those as we go. So we'll deal with them as we're able to do so. So, so this is you know, largely based upon the idea that we want to be able to get active uh, input from the congregation and address specific needs that people might have. And there's also very much an evangelistic component to that. So if you look in Acts chapter 18, you can see that Paul's evangelistic method was to go to synagogues. And when he would go to the synagogues, he would talk with the people there about Jesus. So in, in like... Acts 14, uh, 18, 14, 18, 4, pardon me. It says that he, and that's the Apostle Paul, reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade 
um, both Jews and Greeks. And so when you get there, that word there for reasoned comes from a Greek word dialogeo, which means he dialogued, he spoke with them back and forth. And if you see that in Acts 4, or Acts 18, you can see that it was evangelistic. The idea was, hey, I want to deal with specific issues that might keep a person away from embracing Christ. So I said all that to say this. Um, if you are not a Christian person, but you've got some things that you're struggling with, this is another opportunity to let that question go. So let it out and say, hey, here's what's kind of holding me back, and we would love an opportunity to address that. So what we'll do is we have some questions that were left over from last time. We have some new questions that have come in today. Um, uh, so some relate to space aliens, which are always fun, uh, and then community churches, which is also fun. And so we'll deal with those, and um, we'll take a look at what we had left over from last time, and then if we have time to do more, then we will. If we don't get to your question today, we'll pick it up the next time when we come back together. So the first two relate to our holdovers from last time. And they relate to love and marriage. So let's take a look at those. So the first question comes in and says, Is it right for a Christian to date or marry a non-Christian? Okay, so uh, that's a great question because it's going to have a humongous impact as a life decision. So let me preface this whole thing by saying I'm going to give you what my view on this is. Okay? Um, and it's one that I have thought about quite a bit, and I've studied on a good bit, and I've also seen in reality what oftentimes happens when people go a route where you have a Christian person and a lost person who decide to marry or engage in a long-term romantic relationship. Um, you may come up with a different answer, okay? So uh, if you do, if you study this thing out and you come up with a different answer, your Romans 14 obligation is to proceed as you understand God would have you to do. But um, I will answer the question as I understand it. So here's the way I generally take this. So in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, we have a very well-known passage that talks about being unequally yoked. Okay, So this is a passage that was written to Christian people at a church and gives them general guidance. And the general guidance is, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And then he goes down further and says, because what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has there with light and darkness? So let's just pause on that for a second and make a general observation. What he's saying is that Christian people and people who are not Christian people, worldly people, are completely different kinds of people. Okay, So there's righteous people and then there are lawless people. There are people who are in the light, and then there are people who are in the darkness. We might characterize this by saying that people have a different worldview. Okay? They think the way things work are altogether different. Uh, there's a reason why I oftentimes say that the Christian life is a countercultural life. Christian people are, in fact, different than worldly people. And so he says, if you take those two people and you yoke them together, and that's an agricultural image that's kind of hard for us to grab because us Orange County folks are not really agricultural people, but the idea here is that you take something and you, and you, you bind together two beasts of burden that would be like plowing a field or something, but they're not equal. And so as a result, they don't work together, but they may end up working counter to one another. One of them's going faster, one of them's going slower, one of them's pulling to the right, whatever it might be. It's just not a good match. Okay? Now, I will tell you that 2 Corinthians 6 is not specifically addressing marriage. Okay? It isn't. It's not specifically addressing marriage, but it does have application to that okay? because it's a general principle. And the Bible largely consists of general principles that have broad application. And so the general principle here is that Christians are different than people who are not Christians. Their worldviews will be different. What they're trying to accomplish in life will be different. Their perspective of what's most important will be different. It's like, I'll give you one example of that. As a Christian man, a lot of times I'll say something like this. You know, a hundred years from now, it's just not going to matter. And what I mean by that is 100 years from now, I'll very likely be with my Lord in heaven. Chances are pretty good I'm not going to live to be 150-something years old. So 100 years from now, I'll be with the Lord. And at that point, everything that's happened in this world is gone. Okay? It's not going to matter anymore. Because I live life with an eternal perspective. But lost people don't. 
Okay, they, they live with a, hey, this is all you get. And as a result of that, their total disposition on life is altogether different. So that passage in 2 Corinthians goes on further when it talks about lightness and darkness, and then it goes down and says this, what accord has Christ with Belial? That's a, like a, law, a, a pagan god, okay? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. So again, the notion here is that you are in fact different. Therefore, verse 17, he says, go out from their midst and be separate from them. So this is an acknowledgement out of 2 Corinthians 6 that lost people and Christian people are, in fact, altogether different kinds of people. It's like the, the water and oil thing. Okay? You can put them in the same glass, but they really won't mish together well. Okay? Plus, you have the uh, other problem that when Christian people become closely and intimately involved with, with lost people, it triggers a 1 Corinthians 15 warning which says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And let me tell you where I've seen that in just my experience. Okay, this is just what I've observed over the last 20 or 30 years. What I have observed is that when you have a Christian person and a lost person that become romantically involved, the odds of the lost person pulling the Christian away from the Lord and into the world is much higher than the other way around. Okay, so... Um, is it possible that a Christian person would simply convert the lost person that they're involved with? Yes, it is. Okay, But it's also possible it could go the other way. And again, just in my experience, I've seen that more often than not, the outcome of that relationship is bad for the Christian. Um, and as a result of that, I generally advise against it. Okay, So if someone asks me, well, what's your opinion on that? My opinion on that is probably a bad idea. Okay. Um, can I you know, dogmatically tell you that? No, because 2 Corinthians 6 is not explicitly about marriage or dating. It's just a broad principle. But I think if you apply that broad principle to it, the outcome you get is probably not a good idea. Okay. Now, speaking of marriage, that's the second question. Um, this one says, uh, are we supposed to actively be looking for a spouse or waiting God to bring a spouse to us? Um, that also, that's a very good question. So this is obviously a question from someone who's kind of at that marrying stage in their life or they're contemplating marriage and what's going on. And the answer, to, to sound really simple, is yes, you are. Okay? Um, you're supposed to do both of those, I think. You uh, should be kind of having your eyes open for a spouse as far as what it is that you're looking for in that regard. And then at the same time, trusting for the Lord to provide. Now, here's the biblical example of this. If we go back into the Jewish scriptures, we can read um, about the account where Isaac uh, needed to find a spouse. And so as a result of that, there was this uh, process came where a servant went to go look for a spouse. And as they went about through that process, they're looking for the Lord's guidance and leadership and how it is to go about finding that. This is all back in Genesis 34, 24, 24, I think. Um, and the uh, servant there is prayerful about what it is it's going to find, follows the Lord's guidance and prompting, and the end result is we find Rebekah, right? So in Genesis 24, verse 67, it says, Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. It took Rebekah. She became his wife. He loved her. And so there we find that process working out. So here you see kind of twofold, okay? The person's looking for a spouse, so they go actively looking, but they do so prayerfully, and as a result, they find the right person, and it becomes, I suppose, somewhat a match made in heaven. I guess you could say that. So in this regard, we could say, all right, um, you can actively look, and at the same time, anticipate that the Lord would, would provide that spouse. Now, how's that going to work for us today? Okay, well, first of all, I tell you, this is definitely an area where you'd want to be very prayerful. Okay, so who we select as a spouse is enormously significant because, uh, again, we want to make sure we've got someone who has the same worldview, that we're moving in the same direction, and we want to be pleasing to the Lord. And if we're prayerful about that, then our heart's going to be seeking in the right place. So Psalm 37.4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. 
Okay, now that passage is often misapplied to say that God's going to give me anything I want. But I think the way you should read Psalm 37, 4 is not that God's just going to give you whatever you want, but that God would give you the wants themselves. Okay, the desires themselves will come from God. So if we live a life where our goal is to be pleasing to the Lord and to walk with the Lord and have a meaningful spiritual relationship with our Heavenly Father, then as that relationship grows and develops, the things that we want, our desires, are going to be consistent with the desires of the Lord as we become more and more like Him. Therefore, the things that we are desiring in a spouse will become more and more matched up with the kind of spouse that God would want us to have. We have other passages like Proverbs 3 that tell us, you know, acknowledge the Lord uh, and he'll make straight your paths. The Lord will lead you through life. Okay, now, when we're actually looking for that person, okay, I, I recognize that you don't just like pull up the Sears catalog and flip over for wives and find the one that you want. Um, but when you're looking around and you're considering potential spouses, there is some biblical guidance that we should have. Okay, there are characteristics for spouses that we should look for. Like Proverbs 31 gives the picture of a virtuous spouse, the virtuous wife, the godly wife. I used to work at a Christian bookstore, and we had a, we had a book that was titled, I'll never forget the title of this book, it was The Proverbs 31 Woman and Other Impossible Dreams. Um, I'll never forget that, but uh, the idea is that it describes a person who is a godly, industrious, good woman wife. And Proverbs 31 says, you find that person, man, you have really found a treat. The New Testament equivalent for finding the husband would probably be Ephesians 5. Okay, so Ephesians 5 gives instructions to husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her and so on. And so it talks about a sacrificial kind of love that is focused on making everything prioritized around her um, the passage concludes with the instructions that husbands are to love their wives and wives are to respect their husbands. And I'll tell you that I have never found a marriage ever where the husband had a hard time loving his wife when the wife respected her husband. Okay, I've never seen that. Um, instead, what I've always found is that that corollary works out super duper well. So if you're a man looking for a woman, look at Proverbs 31. Here's the, here's the kind of person you ought to be looking for. And if you're a woman looking for a husband, look at Ephesians 5. Here's the kind of man you ought to be looking for. And recognize if you're looking for the husband, you're going to want to make sure that people are committed to their biblical roles. Okay, So when I'm performing a, uh, a wedding ceremony, we go through marriage counseling beforehand. So we do premarital marriage counseling and then postmarital marriage counseling which covers essentially the same material just from a before and after perspective. So let's make sure we know the program we're signing up for. What is it that godly wives are expected? Okay, one of the things is to be submissive to their husband. What are some of the things that uh, godly husbands are expected to do? They're expected to be a spiritual leader in their home. Okay, so when you're looking for a wife, look and make sure you've got somebody who's willing to follow the biblical role. When you're looking for a husband, make sure this is someone who's going to be able to fill the role of a spiritual leader. These are important elements that come out of the, the biblical process of spouse shopping. So let's make sure that, that we follow them. Uh, again, recognizing that uh, within the Proverbs, we get instructions. Again, don't trust, or rather trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understandings right? In all your ways, acknowledge him. He'll make your path straight. So trust in the Lord to lead you to that person. Now, before we leave this subject, I do want to talk about one corollary. It's closely related, which is, well, what if I don't want to get married? Do I have to get married? Okay. Is it okay for a, a Christian person to remain single? And the answer to that is yes. And, in fact, we have explicit guidance from Scripture on that very subject. So in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, which is a passage in the New Testament that talks about marriage, the Apostle Paul, writing in that letter, also gives instructions about being single. Here's what he says. So 1 Corinthians 7.1. Concerning the matters that you wrote to me about, because they had written Paul and asked about some real specific things. They'd asked about marriage. They'd asked about... Um, spiritual gifts, they'd asked about the resurrection, they'd asked some specific questions. 
He says, about those things that you wrote to me about, first, right out of the gate, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Okay? And what he's talking about is being single. So he says, it's good for a man to be single. But please note, he doesn't say it's better. He doesn't say it's better to be single. He just says that's also good. Okay, so marriage is good. The passage goes on to say marriage is good, but being single is also good. So if a person's like, well, I think I'd rather be single, fine. In fact, look at this. In, in the text a little bit later down, he goes down and he says, I wish that everybody could be like I am. And how was Paul? Single. So I wish everybody could be single because I am. And then he says this, but each one has his own gift from God. His own gift from God. One of one kind and one of another. The Apostle Paul is saying that being single can be a spiritual gift from God. That there are some people who are gifted to be single. And if you're gifted to be single, he says, that's fine. He goes on later, by the way, to say that even if you're gifted to be single, if you want to be married, you can be. It's the only spiritual gift I'm aware of anywhere in the Bible where the person who has it is given an option as to whether or not to use it. But here they are, okay? But if you want to be single, fine. And then he goes on and says, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say it is good for them to remain single. Notice again, he doesn't say it's better, okay? He just says it's it's good, it's okay too. But if they can't exercise self-control, they should marry. So again, even if you're gifted for single, if you want to get married, that's fine. And then he says, because it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, if you do get married, you need to follow the guidance that we just discussed. Okay, which is if I'm looking for a godly wife, it needs to be a godly wife that's committed to the parameters of Scripture for a godly wife. If you're looking for a husband, it needs to be someone who's committed to following the guidance for husbands. So 1 Cor 7.39 talks about what happens when a person dies, right? A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to be married to whom she wishes, but with this caveat, only in the Lord. So there's a lot of discussion. Well, what's that mean? Okay, easiest way to answer that, consistent with Christian principles. Okay, you're free to marry anybody you want, consistent with Christian principles. What are those principles? Well, it's what we've been talking about. Okay, so you go through that and you're good. All right. So um, we have other questions, but I see that we're out of time, so we'll, we'll stop. So we have other questions that relate to theophanies. Uh, we have our community church question. We have questions about aliens, which are not theophanies, but um, we have that too. But I think we'll have to stop here because I think we are out of time. So let me just kind of fast forward us up a little bit. And uh, we'll come back to our remaining questions next time around. So I did want to again tell you that if you do have a question that you'd like to have addressed, um, just send me an email to michael at followthebible.com. We'll put it in our list. And then uh, next quarter, when we do our quarterly stuff, we'll go through and we'll address those and make sure we have them all together. All right, but let's pray together as we conclude our, our scripture time. Lord, thank you so much for our time that we've had here in the Word this morning, the opportunity that that's presented to us to take a look at some issues uh, that are directly on the minds and hearts of the members of our congregation here. And so um, I recognize that today we took a look really kind of at love and marriage questions, which is certainly an important area and an important issue. And so we pray that as we um, take those uh, principles and guidelines that you've provided to us and integrate them into our own life, We pray that for those who are looking for a spouse right now, that they would apply those guidance that you've described for us in your word. For those who have elected to remain single, we pray that the congregation would encourage them in that uh, decision that they've made, and and we would still, again, encourage them to just live godly lives as a single person. And then for those of us who are married, we pray that our marriages would be consistent with what you, again, have revealed in your word, that the husbands would be acting their role godly and the wives would be fulfilling their godly role as well. We thank you that we uh, don't have to struggle with being you know, like just curious as to how we should do these things, but that we can know because you've told us in your word. So thank you for giving us the guidance that you've provided to us there as well. We pray that you would continue to be with us throughout uh, the rest of our day, throughout the rest of our week that's ahead, and we would uh, look forward to walking with you in the days ahead. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Bob?
Please be standing if it's convenient to do so. Our last song will be Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary, number 912. Days are filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary. Every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Please be seated. So our, our last opportunity or act of, of worship that we have today before we leave our auditorium is giving. Uh, as we come to the scriptures, the scriptures definitely have a lot to say about giving, largely in the sense of we give back to the Lord um, in thanks and appreciation for what the Lord has provided to us. And the scriptures tell us, of course, that God loves a cheerful giver. Um, and I will tell you, just as a kind of an add-on to that, you can't outgive God. So uh, giving is a great opportunity for blessing. So there, there are various ways in which we can give uh, today. So one way that you can do that is online through the congregation's webpage. There what you would do is simply go to the church's webpage at followthebible.com, scroll down to the bottom of that page. There's a big green button there that says click here for online giving. And what you would do is click that and then follow the guidance. Uh, very closely related, if you'd like to give electronically by text, you can text uh, the word GIVE to that number on the screen, 714-450-7010, and then that will also enable you to uh, give electronically. Uh, to give tangibly, you've got a couple options. One is mail, um, so the congregation's address is there on the screen, 13211 Fairview Street, Garden Grove, California. You could avail yourself of that. Or you could also give tangibly here at the church campus. So each of the exit points out of the auditorium have a little collection box, and you're welcome to put your gift there. That would be fine. Also, I did want to remind you again, if you are new here or visiting with us today, we'd sure like to know so that we can send you a note or card thanking you for being with us. Uh, the way you would do that is just text the word Orange View, one big word, to 94,000, and then that will bounce that information back to you. And then also, again, as we've mentioned several times, um, a primary mission of this congregation is to help other people begin their new life in Christ. So uh, if you're interested in doing that, you can text the word, all one big word, OV, I'm ready, to 94,000. And then what that will do is it will bounce back some information to you about both what becoming a Christian involves, why you would want to do that, and enable you to have an opportunity to address any specific issues that you might have related to that. But now we're going to go ahead and close up with a word of prayer, and we'll be all done for the day. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for bringing us all here again this week to congregate and to learn about you, God, and uh, what you want for us in our lives, God. I pray that you please be with those that are sick in this congregation and help heal them, God. And for those of us that are healthy, I pray that you please help us stay away from things that might harm us, God. I pray that you please be with the leaders of this country. Help them make decisions that will benefit us all, God. I pray that you please be with us this week and help fill us with the Holy Spirit, God, so that we may be guided by you. I pray this in your son's heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Have a joyous week.